So welcome everyone. Welcome to Digital Hollywood. I'm Cecily Armstrong and you are the crowd that is kicking off the conference. So give yourselves a hand. A round of applause here. Thank you so much. I know that we have some uh, traffic issues happening out there today so I think we'll probably have people streaming in. Um, so you should be in the panel that is the power of influencers accelerating brand value across platforms from internet TV, mobile, and social networks. So that is one of my favorite panels always, and I'm always privileged to be the moderator for it. We have some fun returning um, folks that are on the panel. I will tell you, um, you will see that Spencer McClung is not here. He's got a terrible case of the flu. And Sam is on his way. He had a, a, a little incident on set this morning, so you'll be seeing somebody streaming in here. But we do have actually a great um, intense opportunity here to get some answers, have a great conversation, pick the brains of really these people who are the leaders in, in the industry. Um, so how this is going to work is I'm going to go through some topics. We're going to have some conversation. And then about the last 15 min 10, 15 minutes, um, you'll be able to ask questions. So what I always like to say is as we are moving, um, oh. I just said your name, and here you are. <laughs> we, con we conjured him up. He's here. <laughs> we just started, so all good. So what I would say to everyone is um, as the conversation is happening, um, type in, jot down some questions, some key points, because it's been my experience that as we roll along, something else will come up. So it's a good idea maybe to make sure you get your questions in that you have. Um, and with that, I want to really introduce our incredible panelists. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I don't want to waste a whole bunch of our intense time talking about their bios because they are long and great, <laughs> but you can see them on the Digital Hollywood website. Um, and I encourage you also to follow up with people. Um, and. Think about the fact that every time we'll be doing this panel, we do it every um, session of Digital Hollywood. So in May, you will see them back again. So it's great fun to sort of follow along and see what the changes. I do that when I sit in your position in the audience. I like to go to the panels and say, oh, last time. So you can really see some opinion and some data of what's happened over the last six months. So I don't know. I'm a data geek. So to me, that's fun. All right. So I'm Cecily Armstrong. I'm the CEO of Night Text Productions, the ex executive producer of Night Text Studios. You can go to nighttextproductions.com and see what we're working on right now. Um, I've had a long career. And uh, again, I will not bore you with mine. You can read it online in um, print, television, radio. Um, and on the business side, um, leading organizations based on recurring revenue, subscription-based models in the media and entertainment industry. Um, what I'm really jazzed about right now is what's happening in audio. And um, I'm really thrilled to be the co-chair of the podcast forum, the inaugural one that's here at Digital Hollywood. So that's um, all day Thursday. Look at your program. Shameless plug. It's going to be really great. We booked some incredible speakers. And I'm also programming a live stage where you'll see celebrities from Better Call Saul, Will and Grace, incredible writers from America 2.0, um, and lots of people. Again, look at the program. There's a supplement that you should have received. <coughs> Here that has more information on it about that. And we're also going to talk about influencers and audio and what's happening here. So I'm going to go down the line and each one of you, of course, Isaac, I'm going to start with you because you're you're in the hot seat again, I think we're last time too. <laughs> Isaac from Univision, introduce yourself and tell us what you're working on right now. Sure. Um, hi guys. Uh, my name is Isaac Rosales. I'm senior manager of partnerships and campaigns at Univision. Um, my role is to oversee all influencer driven branded content. Um, so basically finding opportunities and solutions for our advertisers who might already be spending money on linear, radio, digital, and finding a way to add an influencer component to that. Um, and also finding ways that we can use influencers to promote our shows and integrate them across all of our linear programming, um, such as temples or uh, TV programming. Great. Jade. Hi, I'm Jade. I'm a partner uh, in the Alternative Programming Digital Media Licensing and Branding Division at Abrams Artist Agency. 
Um, we work with a lot of digital native content creators to take them, grow their uh, brand on platform, but then take them off of platform into different opportunities, um, including unscripted licensing, branding, podcasts, um, anything and everything that uh, their platform allows. Awesome. Kyle. So I'm Kyle Britt. Uh, I'm director of strategy at Tiny Horse. Uh, we work with uh, studios, content owners, and brand partners to help, uh, you know, what, what, get their message out through influencers, paid media, all that kind of world. Great. Thanks. Sam. Hi, Sam Lee. Sorry again for being late. Um, my title is media strategist at an artist, <laughs> and I think that really includes everything, including going to set and helping a kid scrape his wounds off skateboarder. Um, <laughs> We work with brands, talent, uh, writers, actors, directors, musicians, um, and we help with strategy, uh, building out their businesses and sort of looking horizontally, uh, not just in media, but you think about licensing and apparel um, and sort of everything uh, all encompassing. Awesome, awesome. So we have some inc a, a brain trust up here, so keep your questions in mind. So what I really want to start off with is is kind of defining what is happening um, in the media and entertainment industry as far as influencers go. If you were here six months ago, um, you will see what a dramatic change has even happened over that time. So um, I kind of want to, uh, Kyle, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you, is what do you think the state of the union is right now for influencers in the entertainment industry? Well, It's a broad question. Is, is, but I'll, I'll take a narrow pass to the broad okay. question. Um, Go for it. The you know I'm I'm in the camp that like uh, gets frustrated by the overuse of the term influencers to mean a lot of different things. Influencers mm -hmm. can mean anybody from somebody with a thousand Instagram followers to The Rock. Um, right. I mean, all those are influencers. And really, what we're what we're talking about when we talk about influencers is we're talking about levels of celebrity. Um, and for most people who, who who are influencers at some level, they've got rabid fans who follow them as as, as uh, you know. Uh, as much as they follow a, a you know major celebrity, uh, if there's an influencer that I run into that I love and that I follow, uh, I'm inclined to act the same way bumping into them on the street as I am bumping into the Rock. And I'll be. Uh, but if you I, bump I, into I, the I, Rock, I, it hurts. It's also true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I would, I would, you know, you'd fumble over your words. You, oh, I love your work. I love everything you do. The, right. These, so when we talk about influencers, we're talking about really levels of micro to macro celebrity. And who those people are, and how, how they get their message out. And so there's there's interesting uh, there's an interesting process of of, of, you, of re working with those influencers to find the ways to connect their audiences to the audiences that we're trying to connect them with. And you know you, you can have you have some celebrities who have this massive platform in which you can reach out to uh, you know a, a broad swath of America. And then you've got very niche influencers who have you know. These these very targeted people who are like love love the outdoors, and they're so out, you know outdoors brands run to those people, um, or you have people who are really into running, and you've got you can go to to running brands or sock brands or shoe brands or whatever who are catered to them, and really this the the to answer the broadest version of your question the state of influencers, is it, you're, we're starting to find ways to activate in a in a segmented way across all of these different areas we treat. Uh, influencers as media. We look at it on a, on a CPM basis, on a right. CPV basis. We look at it in a way of saying, you know, how is, is this a more effective way of reaching the audience we want to reach than we can get on, you know, Facebook retargeting or we can get in a, you know, an out of home campaign. How, what, so, the broad, so, so the broad scope as it keeps growing, um, really like most things in um, even a, a product or a brand itself, as it grows wider by nature, it becomes more segmented based on the audience and the target. Yeah. Right. We're going to talk about the buy decision on that later in, later in the panel. Jade, what, what's your take well, right now? What's just, the state of the influencer union? I was just going to say that I think um, the biggest change that we've seen is there's so much more data that brands and companies are looking at and utilizing. Um, two, three years ago, people looked at the follower number and that's kind of how you dictated right. who was working and who wasn't. And now people have wised up and there's a lot more information that you're able to utilize um, to sell through campaigns or to partner on um, unscripted shows and bring over audiences. So I'd say that the biggest thing that we've seen is, is everyone getting a lot wiser to data and how to utilize that. 
same thing at Univision or? Um, yeah, I feel like it's a little bit smarter now. I think we talk about the Wild Wild West happening like five years ago. It's still very much that, I think. Um, but I do think that there are more either grown-ups in the room or people mm -hmm. who have also grew up in the industry who know what they're doing. Right. So I think it's very exciting to see from the branded side a lot of brand safety ha like conversations happening, but at the same time just seeing that a lot of companies are now, I think it's a lot of acquisition as well, where mm -hmm. a lot of big companies are now buying these players who are like, oh, influencers are a real thing, whereas before there was a lot of us just saying, influencers, pay attention to influencers, and now everybody's paying attention to influencers, whether it's Warner Brothers, whether it's at t whether it's Disney, every major company uh, uses influencers, whether it's to promote their brands or, again, to promote, like we do, um, we, I think for the three past years, we were always trying to evangelize, use influencers for your TV shows. They might not be actors, but they can u be used in your reality shows, or they can be used to promote some of your temple shows, like Latin Grammys. And I feel like now the tides have changed, and they keep on knocking on our doors on who oh, is the best influencer yeah. to use. Um, so that's the biggest so change. So the I've show seen. creators, the individual show creators or showrunners are are saying, oh, yeah. maybe, maybe, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we a, yeah. just casted one of the first influencers this summer for a reality show. And again, she doesn't have to act, um, which is probably the drawback of influencers. She can just be herself. She was in a love competition show with her husband, and she was basically being herself. And mm -hmm. they saw the ratings increase, and we do right. that a lot with our reality shows and a lot of like our live programming as well. Right. Yeah, and on breakdowns, we're seeing a lot more people looking for talent that have social platforms and social followings. And so they kind of don't, not necessarily, you have to still be able to act. I mean, the show, they still want it to be successful. Well, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. uh, but they will, they will, you know, they will look to cast people with larger followings to bring right. in an audience. Right. So, Sam, I'm going to ask you the same question. Yeah. I, I would just take it. Um, another approach, um, I look at the state of influencers or creators um, through the lens of the audience, right? So the audiences, as the brands are, audiences are way more savvy today. They know what part they play in the model. Um, and so I think more than ever, they, they're looking for authenticity. They're looking for, you know, humor, entertainment, but also to kind of like learn something. So there's this term going around edutainment. Um, and so I think, I think as our audiences wise up to the to the whole model and how we're using CPMs and selling followers and likes they're they're kind of shying away from the cool kids that's why you're seeing Instagram take away likes and then uh, engagement down across the board on Instagram I think as as kids are more and more depressed more and more uh, skeptical about the entire model they're looking for for real talent or real you know real authenticity so we try to work with talent that we know are going to satiate the needs of the audiences, which are which is ever changing. So I think it's also been. I was going to say. I think there's also been an evolution in what authenticity means to the audience. Right. Like there was this. There, there was this time where authenticity kind of meant. Uh, Oh, you know, you show like behind the scenes of what you're what you do. Like you're, oh, you're just like, oh, this is like, this is like kind of what we do behind the scenes, and this is this is me on set. And now authenticity is really more like I'm in a bathrobe with my hair in a towel, right. and I'm like walking around my house, and, it, and it's a little more like, oh, that's that's actually a real person. Like I'm seeing them in Genuine. the context of their real life. Genuine. Yeah. yeah. Well, so that this is a perfect segue into my next question that I always ask it every time at this panel. So. I'm going to go down the line and just give me your best shot on what you think is the difference between a spokesperson, a celebrity, and an influencer, right? Because this is, I can't tell you the number of conversations that I have about that. And as I was chatting with Kyle earlier, talking about the time of, you know, I had a pretty long career as a spokesperson, and there were brands where it may take a year of my life, and I'm going to the factory to see how are they making those garments for Tommy Hilfiger, and going, you know, to all these different things. So, is it the level of engagement? So, uh, Kyle, I'll start with you since I since I evoked your name. That's fine. <laughs> I, I I'll, have, I'll have the hot take and say that I don't think there is a difference. Okay. I think that there is. You heard it here first. Breaking <laughs> from, news: Digital Hollywood. From from the audience's perspective, they're they 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 they're, they're viewed the same. There, now there is contextual differences in mm -hmm. how they might be used, whether it's on, in a TV spot or whether it's just on their own Instagram channel or whether it's you know someplace else. Uh, and there might be ways that the brand or the studio or the, whoever partners with that influencer and, and and has them integrated into their system. And do they do the education process that 
uh, that, a, that a spokesperson might have gone through 10, 12 years ago, or do they, uh, you know, are, are, do, are the studios and the brands seeking out people who are already integrated into the brand, who already love it, who think that that's, who are already, you know, big fans of it, and therefore can be more authentic uh, spokespeople for it. But I don't think there's categorically just a, a difference in the minds of the audience when you see somebody talking about uh, a brand you, that, that that person is effectively a spokesperson. Jade, you're... Well, I was yeah. just going to say, I think the biggest thing, and there's definitely so much overlap, the biggest thing is kind of separating the difference between a following and an influence. There are celebrities that have large followings. There are influencers that have, or digital content creators that have large followings. Mm -hmm. Those are different than having an actual influence. And so where we kind of focus our, a lot of our representation on experts and people in specific niches that can tell and sell products. And so if you're talking about, you know, someone like Jennifer Aniston pitching dry eyes, you know, you look at Jennifer Aniston and you're like, she probably just got a nice paycheck, love it, enjoy that TV spot. But you look at someone on Instagram who really talks about it often, how she suffers from dry eyes during allergy season and how much these have saved her, they look at it a different way. And they might look at Jennifer Aniston as like a brand awareness play, but working with our influencer would be someone who can add credibility and then influence someone to purchase. Right. So right. that's where I'd say the biggest difference is. But then you have people like The Rock and Shay Mitchell who are big celebrities that actually have real influence as well, and they play a very integral role in that kind of crossover. Right, right. And so for programming at Univision, that must be, is it, is it, I'm going to ask my question a little bit different to you, which is not fair, but um, <laughs> because is it programming versus selling products that's yeah I think from our perspective I agree with Kyle we kind of don't distinguish we look at data um, if you have big engagement rate we're gonna probably pay you more we're gonna sell you higher um, so just like a very I don't know what the word is but just kind of very neutral right yeah however whenever we talk to brands and with Univision there's a huge differentiation um, we've done campaigns with Jay Valden obviously a celebrity and an influencer even though they might have the same following the same engagement there's a clear difference in just the status of somebody, right? right. Um, so for that, I still think that there is a distinguished factor, whether it's the audience, whether the perception, whether they're in more highbrow content on Netflix, or they have albums, or they have a little bit more, I guess, longer content that they've been doing. Um, I do see that there is a lot of frustration with influencers and managers a lot, where they tell us, no, this person's an artist. At the end of the day, we, from a again, branded perspective, we don't care. <laughs> we don't care if they're called artist, uh, influencer, or mm -hmm. a spokesperson. We're still going to be based on the data. So right. I think it really depends on who you're asking. From a TV perspective, there's celebrity all day. They're going to prefer someone who has been on TV shows more than someone who's an influencer. And we have that constant struggle of saying, no, this person is actually going to drive more awareness and more views than this celebrity who has been established on Univision, but again, doesn't have that strong audience appeal. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, I, it's I a mean, really hard answer to the uh, question. <laughs> it, is, it is, and I'm gonna ask Sam here in a minute, but it brings to mind, so my company, we just um, signed a co-production deal with the actress and comedian Kim Coles. Now, Kim, you know, is a, is a bona fide celebrity and, and incredibly talented, but she also, I would consider her an influencer because she has a massive social media audience and um, people all over the world that adore and follow her. So I see what you're saying. So her foot's kind of one, you know, on both sides. Um, Sam, what's your experience with that? Um, I mean, as a manager, personal manager, sort of one of the hats I wear, I, I'm, I'm literally, I have to, you know, this is for work, but I'm, I'm you know, basically wearing, you know, street wear and hanging out with these kids like 18, 19 years old, and I have to get in their, in their worlds and sort of in their ethos, and they definitely hate the word influencer. Uh, they, you know. So a lot of people are saying that these days. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> it, it's just a kind of loaded term. The idea for, for our kids is, you know, they don't really, they don't even know who a lot of celebrities are. You know, they don't, they don't watch Netflix. They're not watching like these, they're watching YouTube. And so they don't really care what we call them. They don't, as long as we're bringing them work and, and they're happy. I think from, from a buyer standpoint, uh, you know, you guys kind of hit the nail on the head. Uh, uh, you, you could be a celebrity, you know, you, Will Smith, for instance, starting his YouTube. He went to CAA and he said, 
all these people have all these, you know, these great social media uh, teams around them. I don't have one. Can you guys make one? And now he's one of the biggest YouTubers, and all the ad revenue is going to Will Smith. So what does that do to the original content creators that were thriving on YouTube? So, you know, are, are A-list celebrities trying to become influencers? Are influencers trying to become traditional media celebrities? I don't know. I, I look at it you now. You know, what what kind of message are we driving, and and to what degree? And I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm an older guy. I'm 37. I don't really, I don't watch these kids on YouTube. But, you know, my little cousin does. And is she influenced more? You know, so I, I don't know. It's a tough question to answer. It's all over and the place. I don't know if it really, if it matters much. I really don't think it matters. I think it, what matters is the audiences. And, well, the audience and, they, and the brands, I think it matters are. to a great deal. And yeah. It, but that matters to the to the audiences, though. Who, it's, yeah. It's more, who are they following? and. Who, do, who are they influenced by? And it goes back to Jade's point. There, there's a difference between name recognition and influence. There's a difference between somebody who, like, oh, I know, to, to, to the dry eyes thing. It's like, I know who Jennifer Aniston is, but, like, I don't believe that authentically she, like, uses dry eyes and, like, came to that, you know, realization to be, oh, I should go partner with dry eyes. It's really uh, not fair. <laughs> Jen Anderson doesn't have representation here today, so. Uh, but 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 it is it, there. There is, it is that difference of like you know, do the people who are who are trying to influence have any, like, are they actually influenced by the people that we're using? Let me let me ask the audience a question here. So, it's a two part question. So first of all, is do you care when you engage with a person that you've see across some platform, you consume whatever they're saying in some sort of way. Do you care if they're an influencer? Raise your hand. That's the person. That's no, do you, no, do you care that they're, it's, right, see? Right, so nobody cares. Do you care, part two, do you care if they've a significant box office type celebrity? When you're engaging with the product, does it matter to you? Is that going to drive you to a buy decision? Well, like, I'm, if I'm going to go do something that's because I'm a big adventurer, you know, I'm going to go to an adventure person. I don't care what The Rock says. I, I'm not going to consider anything that The Rock says. Come to this island or something like that. I could care less. Right, right. Right, right. So, that, so then it does get down to... It gets, the, it gets the down to experts and experts and, and, and micro, people. right? And, and you follow people for the interests that you're interested in, and so I think you have different people for different interests. And so you might follow a beauty influencer because you want to know her skin care tips. You might follow my client Sean Johnson because she just had a baby, and you want to know what her must-have baby products are because she's doing this on her own, and you're about to do it on your own, and you trust that this is something that you need to know. So you you follow different people for different purposes. And you might love, you know, again, Jennifer Aniston, sorry. Uh, Jennifer Aniston on Friends, and you might follow her because you kind of want to see behind the scenes things of what's going on on Friends. And like, you follow different people for different purposes, which is where it goes back to whether someone has a following or an influence. And I right. think that those are the different kinds of and opportunities. So it gets, it gets into segmentation is what we're, yeah. we're talking about. And you've too. also seen influencers who have abused that privilege and, and, and then and they become so commercialized in everything that they do where they every, every post or every other post is an ad and it's like I don't I don't know that I trust what you're saying anymore I don't know that like you, you're no longer like uh, telling me to do things that you authentically believe and maybe they do authentically believe all of those things but they've kind of overdone it on pushing towards like trying to drive revenue through it and say oh I, well, I can I, you know I can go partner with all of these different brands and all of these different opportunities or whatever it is if it's a venture and it's partnering with a you know a destination or a specific mm -hmm. company or whatever that and you go oh well is it is you, you start to question the more and more they do it, yeah. is it real? And it's almost it's the same commercialization conversation about uh, about celebrities. I'm sorry to continue using Jennifer Aniston, but like so you, you, know, <laughs> you but but like She's the, 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 the more right the more, now, the more right? and more brands that a celebrity <laughs> partners with, the less each of those brands matters. Right. The, le the less you think that 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 that, that, that partnership means something to the per to the person who's partnered. But also, with isn't that a part of the big role of the the talent, the creator? Um, uh, the influencer, the spokesperson, isn't that the role of their management too? Well, I also think that to guide that career and overexposure. About, and when you're talking about like the top one percent of these influencers that are successful, they turn down ninety nine percent of the right. deals 
and so take one percent because the most important thing is their audience and that loyalty to their audience because as soon as they lose that they don't have any more brand deals or content opportunities right. to, to move forward. So you will be surprised at how much money these people are turning down. Um, and you'll see a very few amount of sponsorships on their current. I platforms. do find that surprising. It is surprising. Actually, yeah. But there, you know, if you think about it, especially the people that started on YouTube in 2008 and 2009 when there was no money to be made, and this is something that they were doing because it was a passion and something that they were excited about. Self-funding, working yeah, every, as a barista are, somewhere or whatever. These are entrepreneurs. Right. And right. these are people right. that have created, they started with zero followers, just like all of us. And what they've been able to do to get to millions and, and millions is incredible. And so I think the influencer term kind of denigrates what they actually have done and what they've actually created. And so I think for us, the way we look at our clients are digital native content creators who are actually entrepreneurs and doing a lot more different and unique things and paving the way for traditional media companies to kind of utilize what they're doing. And so I, I think that it's really important when you when you kind of talk about them, it is with a certain level of respect and, and kind of the, what they've done is amazing. And as representatives, we're here to kind of be a sounding board and bring them opportunities and, and kind of have that dialogue with them. But in, in kind of full transparency, they are the boss and they've gotten to where they are. And so it's giving them that trust and making well, sure they feel I'm glad to see control. it. It's a lot of hard, I mean, it's a yeah. lot of hard work. And I think that a lot of um, these entrepreneurs and creators um, really do deserve the the credit that they get. So you brought up followers. So let's um, get that genie out of the bottle and talk about uh, followers versus fans. And um, you know where where do we stand with that? And you know this whole industry. We talk about this at every Digital Hollywood and lots of panels about um, being sort of at the mercy. Of, of the platforms and the algorithms. So I don't know, Sam, do you want to weigh in on, on your perspective on fans versus followers? Yeah, uh, followers are fellow users of the platform that you're on that are also using the same platform. Who owns those followers? The platform, not us. So Zuckerberg or Twitter, whoever. Uh, ByteDance if it's TikTok. Um, and, and the platform drives those followers to really who they they, they have control over where those followers are going. You don't really have much control uh, in the user interface of an entire platform. You have control over the content you put out and then how you create fans out of those followers. And I think fans are your convertible uh, degree of uh, your, your followers. So if you look at any, any, go to anybody's platform, they have a million followers, look at how many likes they get. Those 100,000 or, or around there are going to be those fans, and then maybe of those people, 1% of them are convertible into maybe buying your hoodie or your shirt or going to see your movie or, or whatever it is. So followers, again, fellow users of a platform, uh, they're not yours. We don't own them. Influencers don't own them. Creators don't own them. The, the platforms do. And so, yeah. So I, mean, I want to I ask Isaac to weigh in on this because from a perspective of programming across a network, you know, you have so many different formats and environments that, um, like you said, whether it's a, I don't know, is it a 22-minute chat show? Is it a reality show? Is it a, a sitcom? You know, wh what is it? I mean, how, how that's got to be a huge challenge as to determining really what is a fan base versus followers. Do you guys even look at followers? Um. Yes, but I think we uh, kind of ignore followers. Um, we also, like the thing that we price are anything that we do is engagement. Um, so every pricing model that we do, every time that we're recommending talent is how engaged the audience is. Um, and how, uh, like if their audience actually has an affinity for Univision and for anything Hispanic or for anything of the brand, right? So I think I said this last time that most of the time we're looking for unicorns. I think every single brand needs to be doing that and making sure that Whoever they partner is attuned and it has an affinity to that specific brand or that partnership or that show. Um, for instance, for this show, we knew that Ana Alvarado had, which is the, the girl that got casted, she had a, her audience and her show was always very reality based. So we're not going to go pitch a person who's doing skateboarding into a love competition show, right? So it has nothing to do, I think it does have to do with the following because a lot of the producers are looking at this, a lot of the people who don't work day to day with influencers are looking at this, but then it's our job to go and educate them and say this person actually will be more successful and will drive more engagement and you will actually see more success with this. So. 
Right. I think there is the follower number, but then for us, and we have so many tools now at our disposal that we can look at engagement rate and who's actually engaging with them. So that's the most important metric for us. So Jade, what happens when likes and follows and all that evaporates potentially, or evaporates and then they go, holy crap, and they bring it back? <laughs> well, I think, you know, obviously with Instagram taking away likes, and I, I think it's mm -hmm. going to be coming this week, I think engagement will be down across the board. I think, you know, there's something when you see someone else liking something, you like it too. So I think it'll affect everyone, um, but again, it'll all be relative. So we'll see what it actually what it does, and maybe it makes people more incentivized to engage and put out content that they're excited about, and not because they're doing it for the likes. I think we'll just we'll see. Um, but I, you know, I think that the people that are creating content or are passionate about what they're doing, they're going to stay passionate about what they're doing, um, and the people who are in it for the quick buck are probably going to fade away. And I, I think it'll be, it'll probably even out the playing field a lot. Right. Instagram's not taking away views, so they're just trying to drive audiences to video. to video and content creators to make video because advertisers want to run ads over and before videos, not photos. So go to Visco for photos, I guess. Yeah. Right. And to add to that last part, sometimes we have producers that come and say, let's work with this influencer who has millions of followers. Half of their followers are based in Latin America. Right. And it, it doesn't move the needle for Univision because we're just U.S. based. So right, again, it right. just depends on being very savvy of kind of everything that everyone's saying on like where their audience is where and audience how can they actually be converted. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, you know, pushing to video and using pre-roll, mid-roll, post-roll, um, when influencers are really used to, these entrepreneurs and creators are really used to talking about brands. So. If I'm a viewer, if I'm the audience, and I'm watching a video that I've already had to, maybe I can't skip, I don't know, pre-roll, and then I've got a brand person, an influencer, that is also, based on their skill level, um, creating content that really is brand integration into a script or off the cuff or however we get it, then there's a mid-roll, then there's more brand, and then there's a post-roll. So what does that environment look like well, for the audience? I think that's a little bit up to the influencers to self-manage. That happens on YouTube already, where uh, you can turn off ads on a video. You mm -hmm. can say, I don't want to make, I don't want to make monetize this content uh, with a pre-roll. You can specify, I don't want pre-roll. I don't want non-skippable pre-roll. I want a sidebar ads, but no video it, video insertion ads. Um, you can specify that, and so the influencer will have to manage, will have to start ma managing more uh, narrowly and tightly. How do, how do they allow advertisements to encroach on the stuff that they are out there pr promoting? Because the idea of, the, 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 the core idea behind influencer marketing is that it's more authentic when it comes from a person rather than just a pre-roll or a post-roll ad like is on you know, traditional media. And so if, if those, if those pre-roll, mid-roll, post-roll ads are encroaching on their credibility as a creator, then they're gonna turn them off and they're gonna just gravitate more towards the deals that will allow them to do content integrations rather than ads that are pre-roll or post-roll. Right, right. The question will be if uh, platforms start turning off that ability and start cool. saying you can't, you can't say that we're not, you're not going to run ads before or after this content. And that's where the data, the data is going to become even more acutely important. So... Are, are they, they're pushing people that allow the pre-roll uh, pre and post-roll. I would imagine that the algorithm is, so the YouTube algorithm specifically supports watch time. So anyone who's keeping people on the platform to continue watching is people that they'll promote. And I'm sure that they're going to promote people that make them money. Right. And so the people who are putting on ads will probably be promoted in the algorithm higher. I mean, we won't know because Google won't tell us, but it's a business. And so if you think about what makes people money and what works and what doesn't, that's why family-friendly content is promoted and, and is doing really well and, and it has a higher CPM on the ads, whereas people who, not to hate on the Paul brothers because they, they're talented in their own right, but their content isn't as family friendly, so they're not probably being promoted as much in the algorithm. Um, so I think it, it does depend. So let's talk about the gorilla in the room, and because this is the first panel, I get to bring it up first, but it will be at every panel, I'm sure, and it has been the last couple years, it really is 5G. So any insights? If we don't want to talk about it, we don't have to, but I feel like in this world, um, 5G is, is, is really going to be a game changer. Sam? I just left the Mobile World 5G conference. Mm -hmm. uh, I was downtown like 
last week or a week or two ago, and I think the biggest the biggest takeaway for me was the doubling and tripling of the sizes of audiences in the world, uh, different regions who you know today don't have a phone or internet or are going to have internet in the next three to five years, super quick internet, um, and so content will kind of spread around the world. And I think I think as creators, as representatives, we have a fiduciary duty to those new those regions who heretofore haven't seen anything as crazy as like a Logan Paul video. Uh, you know, and we've had 120 years of moving pictures to kind of grow and evolve our tastes to come to a Pulp Fiction or whatever, you know, we're okay with like nonlinear, crazy Kim Kardashian, you know, over there, I don't know. So I think, I think as content, you know, we have 550 million uh, listeners, streamers now in music, that's expected to double in the next two to three years and triple by the end of the decade. That's insane. So it's phenomenal growth. Yeah. I mean, how do you even get your arms well, around it? It's going to cause, a, you know, we've talked about data several times on this panel already. It's going to cause more of a focus on looking very closely at the data because as audiences get more and more global because there's more and more high-speed internet access across the world, uh, it's going to change how we calculate what, you, if you've got a brand who's only U.S., yeah. Like, they're not going to want to spend as much money on it. On, even, even if it's the following is just as big, even if the engagement is much as, as, as big, they, they'll, they won't want to spend as much if the audience is 90% developing world or, or the rest of the, the world and only 5% of the U.S. Well, I was just going to say, I think it also really changes the way we view, like, specific types of content. So, obviously, Quibi is a big player in the short form, three to five minute Con, like pieces of content, which is if your mobile is going to be having that fast of internet, like, you know, if you're on your phone, you're not watching an hour and a half video. Right. You don't right. have the time for it. Yep. So right. those three to five minute pieces of content are actually perfect if you can stream it over really high quality, fast, reliable internet. That's going to, that's going to change kind of the way we view and our viewing habits. Right. Isaac? Um, I have nothing else to add. I think it's <laughs> awesome for creators and for us. Yeah. It doesn't change for Univision because Fortunately or unfortunately, we're kind of geofenced within the U.S., so we constantly have these conversations where managers give us a quote, and then we go back to the data and say, here's the quote based on your U.S. audience. Um, so it's, yeah. it's yeah. Um, for us. But they just, really, really want what their talent in there. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I, I guess that's just the data for us to have leverage, right? right? And, right. and it, it's, everything's not equal, and, and we it, just use it. That will change how brand partnerships are done. Because I if think, you, I if think it's got, going to be gigantic. Like if you've got a following that is truly global, and you're getting brands that are regional, and, and they're going to do full brand integrations where a whole video is focused on the content mm -hmm. for a, a brand that 90% of your following or 60% of your following can't buy. Like, right. that, y y all of a sudden, you know, to the same ar argument of credibility with your audience, your credibility starts to get chipped away. If, you know, I live in Indonesia and all of your content is for US only brands, and you're doing a bunch of like US only integrations, and I'm like, I can't, none of this matters to me. Right, right. I mean, from a, from a consumer side, wow, what great content's coming our way, right? Totally. So um, that will be exciting. So I'm going to turn it over and do some questions. And go right ahead. Say your name. Uh, Scott Kramer. Um, question is, uh, like Instagram likes, we know what's coming. But it seems that like 95% of these platforms, you don't know what's coming your client side. <laughs> so how do you plan for that in your plans? Like how do you tell a brand, like, hey, just be prepared, shit may change at any second? Well, I, listen, I think a year ago when we were on this panel, I don't think we knew anything about TikTok. And TikTok is on fire. And so there's, you have to adapt and you have to be able to be nimble and work with what you're working with. So I think Elf Cosmetics did a really good job with a TikTok campaign where they worked with the platform, came up with a specific catchy song they knew would go viral on the platform, worked with six influencers. And it went, it, I think it's over 3 billion it's impressions crazy, and, yeah. and views for this brand that probably didn't cost them that much. But it was people who were willing to take a risk based off of what they've learned in the past. So they knew that integrating influencers is important. They knew that being uh, native to the platform and their best practices was important. And so you take what you've learned and you quickly adapt. And anyone who doesn't adapt will get left behind because it's all happening so quickly. And so for us, the way we look at, you know, when we're talking to our talent about how to plan for things, it's, you know, for me, I, I want all of my clients to have a blog or a website that they own so that they can always drive people and have a, a mailing list or people, fans that they can kind of control. But it's also saying what works for your audience and whenever a new platform comes up or a new platform kind of 
goes down, you can kind of translate and work with your content and, and modify it in different ways. And for us, we couch it in terms of uh, short-term campaigns, long-term strategies. Um, if you have a long-term strategy where you know who you what who you want to move to what place or what you want to be communicating about your brand or what you want to be communicating about the content that you're creating or whatever it is, uh, your short-term campaigns can change. Like a, a change can happen, and you're not impacted if it was a if it's a month or two month long campaign, and then you're you're pivoting, you're doing something new when you get the new information. One way to forecast is, it's a little boring, but honestly, watch C-SPAN. I get so much information from what's going on, really, uh, FCC, the meetings that they're having mm -hmm. right now. I mean, everybody's excited about TikTok, but I think the talk, the, the, the clock is ticking on TikTok in that <laughs> I have a national security background. There's your quote. Police. There's your quote for your I was military media. police, and I'll tell you, uh, right now in, on Capitol Hill, there are he hearings going on, meetings going on relative to ByteDance, which is a Chinese-based company that owns TikTok. The reason TikTok makes everybody think that they have such big followings and so many views and so many impressions is because they merged 200 million Chinese users from their TikTok with the Western's version, which was Musical.ly. So, you know, people growing exponentially, they're not that good of a creator. They're just, they have a whole other country with 1.4 billion people on the app. So, you know, and not only that, uh, they're mining our data, they're mining information, so Congress is aware of this. There's, there's meetings going on on the Hill right now. There might be a forced uh, severance. Uh, ByteDance might have to get rid of uh, TikTok and sell to an American company, or it goes away altogether. Um, you, know, you could find out about what's going on with Facebook and Twitter. I just watch C-SPAN. I find out what's going on. I follow the FCC, the commissioner, and you could really forecast uh, you know, starting with policy. Isaac, you want to jump in? Yeah, I feel the, the best content is just going to be changed. Like the best, uh, smartest influencers that I've seen have constantly been changing. Uh, the ones that kind of go away or fizzle away are the ones that stick to strategy and just pretend that that's going to like work forever. Um, we've been like really ramping up on our end brand safety and family content. Um, content for influencers for the past six months and you're kind of seeing now some of the effects that are going to happen in, in January, right? So for us, we're constantly trying to have conversations with Instagram, with Facebook, with YouTube and seeing kind of kind of reading between the lines. Sometimes they have blog posts, but they obviously don't share everything that's going on, um, but just constantly trying to see what the next change is coming because that is a reality. I feel like a year in digital years is like 10 years mm -hmm. in <laughs> real life. It, like that's the only thing, like six months, everything's going to be, the next panel's going to be different. I see Very Frank different. Donner in the crowd. Can you stand up, Frank? We can't hear you. I think there's always going to be a place for an influencer, and what that means is going to change for sure. But you're always going to ask your friend, your mom, your friend's friend, like what products they're using, what are they liking, because you trust your friends to give you advice. And what an influencer is, is someone who has a, a, an audience that has built loyalty and trust, and what that will look like and wh what those platforms will be is going to change. But the premise of trusting someone's opinion is not going to change. And, and the question I just want to get in here for our um, live streaming audience is, what is uh, a five-year looking glass into what um, influencers will be? I think they'll still be around. There will be a space for them, uh, whether it's a new platform like AI or VR. But the platforms that prioritize influencers and help them monetize, I think those are the ones that are going to win. Uh, you saw Vine, it, it kind of disappeared because it wasn't prioritizing influencers. YouTube has always put the creator at the forefront. They are the ones that are providing the content. They're the ones, the reason that the uh, platform exists. So I think there will be always a, a platform. Um, so I don't know, if I was a creator, I would be excited and uh, again, just being able to see what the platforms are coming and see which ones are prioritizing me as a content well, creator. And a as the internet has widened the scope of what local means to us, yeah. and local now means a lot bigger than it did 10 years ago, 20 Very years ago, point. 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's a, there's a huge amount of decision anxiety that people have about when they're making a buying decision. If you're especially like you know new moms are a big one of those groups. Um, you've got people who are you know newly married, newly in the job market, and who are like oh, oh, I, I don't know what to do. How do I how do I make my resume great? How do I make sure that I'm taking care of my my kids in the right way? All of them will look to somebody who's been there before, and they'll look to their their local community like they always have. But their local community is bigger now than it was then. Mm -hmm. And so the local community includes people who are, you know, big influencers who they maybe have never met, but they, they see them, they've seen them authentically interact with their audience, they've seen them authentically interact with their family, and they trust their opinions. And I say, okay, that's at least, that's somebody I can look to. So I agree with everybody else. It, they will still be around. The format will 100% change. Um, in five, if you, if you said five years ago, could you have predicted these things that exist now? No, none of us could have. Right. So we have uh, ten minutes left. So I want to get a show of hands about how many questions do we have, so I can gauge this. Okay. So we're going to do a little shorter answers, so we can get to more people. Go ahead, please. Say your name. Hi, uh, Ira List with the Three Black Dot. We're an influencer marketing studio and a 360 uh, transmedia uh, company. I'm just curious: has anyone else experienced uh, brands that are now? Sam, you Our clients know we'll drop them if they don't forward, forward an email to us. So, I mean, everything, it's about loyalty. That's my number one pet peeve. So, I was just going to say, do you mean like brands going through a, a third party to create content or just going directly to a DM? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I mean, we work with the brands directly. And so there's a lot of, there's influencer agencies that we work with, influential out there, um, we, that we work with often because they're working with a lot of brands and, and the brands trust them to execute a large campaign. But there are also brands that we work with directly on like two to three of our talent um, because it's cheaper and you don't have to pay that middleman fee. And especially if you trust the influencer to create high quality content and you don't feel the need to include a third party production company in creating that content. It's all, I mean, uh, it seems to me, I mean, for us, we don't care either way because our, our profits stay the exact same. Um, but I think it's just on the brand side what's most cost effective and what kind of helps them in their time. Mostly. I mean, like media buying, anything that a brand can insource and save money, they will. Right. The question is, what value are, and I, and I say right. as an agency that does this, that isn't in, like that does play middleman between brands and influencers, um, we have to think, we have to find the value that we create. Absolutely. Like what, what is what what do, what do we bring to the uh, brand that is that makes it better than them going directly to the influencer? That's right. And That's if right. we can bring something, uh, and we can demonstrate what that something is, we can win. Then you yeah. get more clients. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So another question. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, can you say your name? Alexander. And so, so what's your question? My question is, how do I build a good brand, no, data strategy, or, or how, how do I approach like data as an actress who doesn't really care to influence? I, I want to book roles, but I do care about data. Thank you. Um, I was just going to, I mean, we, so in terms of like, you have access to your data. Right, so right. you can kind of look through your data and say, when I post at 5 p.m., I have great engagement, but when I post at 10, it flops. So I think it's utilizing that data that you have. And then in terms of like finding a partner to help you with that strategy, there are social media agencies that help with that. Right, I that's what I was going to say. Yeah, and you, and you know, quite frankly, all of these platforms and tools have incredible knowledge base. Yeah. So, you know, maybe pour yourself a glass of wine, a cup of, <laughs> cup of green tea, whatever your flavor is, and, um, you know, park yourself and watch some. That uh, Because then if you actually do work with an agency, engage an agency, you're coming to the table with more knowledge than, than you have right now. But it's a good question. Yes? 
Okay, tick, tick, tick. <laughs> So, like I said earlier, the, how the internet has like widened what local means to us. There still is there still is a preference among people to engage with people that they consider to be local. There's still a community aspect to it, which is why actually you see like the the biggest growth in influencers right now is in micro influencers, not in the, the big influencers. There's more micro influencers popping up, and they're growing at a faster rate than anybody else. And that's because it's like it's, it's a small community. You want to be a part of something. You know, even uh, uh, I, I forget your name back there in the back, but you mentioned that you followed Casey Neistat since the beginning, and you feel like a part of the of the Casey Neistat community. And that's like you know you watch it grow, and that's exciting. But like the, the if you're if you're in early, you feel like an insider. You go like, oh yeah, yeah, I was I followed when it was just like a thousand people, and that feels exciting. And so while there is like a global growth of this, these audiences, they will they will continue to be still smaller communities. Uh, even if that small community doesn't all live in the same area, they just and, live all across the world. And real quick, super quick, what what do you define? And whoever jump in here, but also Kyle, what does Tiny Horse define as a micro? I mean, I because mean, a lot of people talk about micro, macro, mini macro, micro. Like, I mean, where are I've, I've heard terms of like nano, nano influencers. Yeah, I've heard nano influencers like lately. Thousand. That's yeah. right. Um, I'm a nano. <laughs> I mean, well, nanotechnology is important, so let's go there. Yeah. Really, I, really, I would say, like, you know, uh, ten to a hundred thousand, something like that. Yeah, okay. that, that would be. All right, that would be let's get ball. another question. And I was just curious. Go ahead. We have a lot of cannabis brands that want to work with our clients. So there are some clients that are open to it, which is great. But the biggest issue is the I don't know, LDS compliance. I don't know if that's the right way yeah. to frame it. But it's you have to have an audience over 25 to be able to market. And on YouTube especially, like the audience is a little bit younger. It's getting older. So I think the hardest part is like we have talent that are, are open and excited to do it. It's just following the rules and making sure that they're not advertising to an audience that's too young, I think is the biggest kind of hurdle as of right now. Yeah. But yeah. we're open to it. Everyone's kind of open Isaac, to it. Isaac, you want to jump in? Yeah, for our influencers or the influencers that we work with, I think there's a side effect. If they do work with, no, no pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> if you work with a cannabis brand, you might be disqualified to work with our CPG uh, brands that are yeah. very, very brand, like they have family content at their, I don't know, at the, their North Star, right? So. They have to make that decision if it's an opportunity cost for them in the future, um, and maybe you as a brand too. Like, are you maybe increase the price because there's an opportunity cost for them in the future? There's like a cannabis Guys. community though online, like a cannabis community of influencers online. So you may not be able to go to like get like Eliza Koshy to promote, you know, medical cannabis, but there are yeah. definitely a huge community of, of like you know cannabis influencers. I'm sorry, everyone, we can't get to all your questions, but um, we got to wrap up because we are. But I, real quick. I mean, like two seconds here. Like, what's next for you? What are you excited about? Um, what are you most excited about right now? Oh, uh, uh, Kyle, jump in. Yeah, I'm coming back to I, you, Sam. I, I'm excited about cross media partnerships. We're working right now with streamers to license uh, influencers' content on other platforms onto streaming platforms, and also have them do marketing work in the rest of the content that they place on the major platforms okay. to drive audience to OTT. Sam. The, the siloing that you're seeing, um, you know, Quibi and Net Netflix losing all the Marvel stuff, I, I like that because it's good for content creators. Like, Netflix is looking for a ton of children's content. So if you know anybody that's writing, tell them to start writing some cartoons because they're looking for it. You know, awesome. I like the siloing effect because it, it actually creates a demand. Okay, Jay? Uh, I, I mean, very excited about creating consumer products with a lot of our clients who can leverage That's their platform great. to sell and podcasts. We have a lot of clients. Yeah. Yeah. And Abrams has a, a in-house uh, podcast studio at our agency. So our oh, you do? Okay. So we have to yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Isaac? Just brand safety. I'm, I'm excited to see companies that actually can tackle it. 
Uh, we do it in-house. It's very manual, and uh, so it's kind of boring, but it's exciting for us because <laughs> it minimizes the work that we have to do um, and the people that we have to hire for that. So. Nothing is boring. Come on. <laughs> We're in showbiz, baby. All right, so big round of applause for Victor Harwood, Digital Hollywood, our panelists. Applause for yourselves. Thank you for being here to kick everything off. And um, come, come meet her. No pitching, but come meet. Oh, is it no pitching? No pitching. Is that like a rule? No pitch. We're not a pitch fest here. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so nice meeting you. You're at ICM, right? Uh, yes, I saw ICM for a second. Good to you.